Okay, so welcome everybody to this today TMS. Uh, I leave the floor to Chantal, the chair of today, and uh, welcome the, Dr. Conti, and thanks for to staying here with us. So please, Chantal. Uh, yes, good morning, uh, everyone. I'd like to welcome Dr. Maria Conti and thank her for joining TMS today. Dr. Conti received her master's degree in medicine and surgery at Sapienza University of Rome and specialized in pediatrics during her residency, which she also completed in the University of Rome. She completed her PhD. Researching innovations in the University of Rome and is currently a researcher there in the maternal and child health and urological sciences department. Uh, so Thank you again for presenting for us today. And uh, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Chantal, for your presentation. And thank you uh, for inviting me for this talk. Uh, I hope you will enjoy it. Um, please let me know if you guys can see the presentation and the slide so I can start. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So today uh, I will talk to you about new strategies to enhance early life immunity. And in particular, uh, I will talk to you about uh, some of our recent studies uh, about mucosal immunity in the newborn. But uh, I'd like you um, to have an idea, a general idea of the immune system uh, in early life. So uh, the neonatal immune system is distinct uh, um, compared to uh, older children and to uh, the adult immune system. And this difference is due to uh, the transitional uh, immune system of the newborn, which reflects the uh, passage, the transition from the intrauterine life to the extrauterine life. So during intrauterine life, the fetus lives in a quasi sterile environment. And the aim of the immune system is to coexist with the mother and to avoid the rejection. Soon after birth, the child is suddenly stimulated by a lot of microbes never encountered before and so the baby needs to um, um, act, to active his immune system uh, to be protected against these pathogens while at the same time he needs to avoid hyperinflammation which can be very dangerous in early life because the uh, baby needs his energy to grow. So um, during intrauterine life, to have an idea, there are a lot of uh, uh, mechanisms and factors uh, um, um, that allows uh, the, the fetus to grow inside the mother and to avoid rejections because uh, pr probably you know that the fetus express uh, paternal antigens that uh, cannot be uh, recognized by the mother. Um, so the aim of the immune system, maternal immune system, and the fetal immune system is to avoid the rejections. And there are local and systemic factors that mediate the maternal tolerance to the fetus. To the fetus. Uh, this table uh, summarizes some of these factors. So that they are all important. Uh, some of the um, uh, well-known factors are, for example, uh, T regulatory cells, uh, maternal and fetal T regulatory cells, uh, and also uh, a different innate immune response, uh, both from the maternal immune system and the fetal immune system, um, uh, that is an um, anti-inflammatory uh, response rather than a pro-inflammatory response. So uh, maternal uh, macrophages and uh, NK cells uh, um, um, respond to the stimulation, uh, producing anti-inflammatory cytokines rather than pro-inflammatory cytokines. And these are, uh, are just some of the uh, mechanisms that uh, uh, ensure um, maternal fetal immune compatibility. Uh, 
But actually, the immune system uh, um, starts uh, uh, its development very early uh, during uh, pregnancy. Um, again, the aim of the immune system is different uh, during intrauterine life compared to extrauterine life, but still, uh, hematopoiesis starts uh, very early. Uh, it starts uh, during the third week of uh, pregnancy in the yolk sac, which is the first uh, uh, site for hematopoiesis uh, and remains uh, the most important site for hematopoiesis uh, till uh, the uh, tenth weeks uh, of ten week of pregnancy. And as you can see on the um, uh, on the uh, right, uh, uh, first uh, uh, cells uh, um, that develop uh, during intrauterine life uh, are innate immune cells, including macrophages. Uh, macrophages, mast cells, uh, and also monocytes and dendritic cells. And these cells um, are um, so the first one to emerge uh, as soon as the third week of uh, uh, pregnancy. Uh, during the third week of pregnancy. Uh, after the yolk sac, uh, the um, fetal, uh, fetal liver becomes uh, uh, the major site for hematopoiesis, uh, uh, starting from the fifth week of pregnancy uh, till uh, week 20. And then finally, uh, bone marrow become, becomes the major site uh, uh, starting uh, uh, around the uh, around week 11 of pregnancy until birth so uh, if the uh, first cells to emerge are innate immune cells, uh, also immature TMV cells start to develop uh, during uh, actually uh, late first trimester. But to have uh, uh, an independent, uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, a, a specific and dependent uh, TMV cell response, uh, we need to wait uh, um, late pregnancy and actually uh, the birth of the fetus, uh, so neonatal life, uh, when all these uh, uh, cells uh, will encounter the um, different antigens and become specific uh, and also able to produce specific antibodies. So um, uh, this was to um, um, introduce you an important concept uh, that is the um, high reliance of the immune system in early life on the innate defense rather than on the adaptive response of the immune system. So newborns in, in the very first days and weeks of life are highly reliant on uh, innate immune mechanisms for host protection uh, rather than adaptive uh, immune mechanisms. Uh, in fact, germinal center activity is impaired, also antibody affinity, uh, and uh, um, uh, there is a dominance of transitional B cells rather than uh, mature and memory B cells during uh, uh, in early life. Um, this is, um, seems complicated, but it's uh, to have an idea of cytokine productions uh, in early life compared to uh, older, older uh, stages of life. So innate immune cells uh, upon stimulation uh, produce different uh, uh, kind of cytokines and in particular in early life preterm newborns and also fertile newborns uh, innate immune immune cells produce high level of anti-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-10 uh, compared to older individuals. Uh, we uh, can observe a switch from anti-inflammatory uh, cytokine production to pro-inflammatory cytokine productions. And this is in line uh, with what I told you before uh, about uh, the um, uh, importance uh, of maintaining fetomaternal tolerance during intrauterine life and also to avoid hyperinflammation uh, early in life uh, uh, because the uh, energy um, uh, demands in early life uh, are um, or needs to be um, uh, directed for uh, growth rather than uh, hyperinflammation. 
So, uh, and when I, um, um, when we talk about the importance of innate immunity in early life, um, uh, we talk about not just uh, um, immunity um, uh, of innate immune cells uh, or, or other factors, but also uh, the immunity represented by uh, mucosal barriers uh, and uh, uh, in particular the skin and mucous membranes. Membranes. So if you uh, focus on the uh, skin and mucous membranes uh, uh, of a full term uh, newborn, uh, you can actually see that these sites uh, are uh, um, protected uh, for, uh, for example, the skin is protected also um, uh, by a layer uh, named vernix caseosa uh, that contains antimicrobial peptides and factors and that mucous membranes are really important also for host protection uh, because they are um, uh, protected also by uh, secretory IgA uh, of maternal origin but also um, uh, secreted by uh, the baby uh, itself. And the other, con um, uh, an important consequence of the uh, impairment of the adaptive immunity in early life uh, is uh, um, the um, inefficiency, if we can say this, of vaccination um, in the, during the very first days of life. Uh, so vaccination in the newborn is not always effective, actually. Uh, and this is because of the impairment of the uh, adaptive immunity. Um, there are just three vaccines uh, licensed for use uh, for use at birth. These vaccines are uh, the HBV vaccine, the BCG vaccine, and OPV vaccine. The first one is actually administered also in industrialized countries um, soon after birth uh, to babies that are born from positive seropositive mothers. Um, and is the vaccine against the uh, hepatitis B, of course. Uh, BCG and OPV vaccines are not uh, routine, routinely administered in industrialized countries, but are administered in countries where uh, these diseases are endemic, of course. And these vaccines are really interesting because they are both, as you can see, live attenuated vaccines. So um, the newborn is not so vulnerable as we might think. Uh, um, live activated vaccines that are considered vaccine uh, in a certain sense uh, uh, dangerous for vulnerable immunocompromised uh, um, organisms are actually given uh, in newborns. Also newborns born preterm, there are several trials uh, including the BCG vaccine given in preterm uh, newborns, and these vaccines are absolutely safe and are able to induce a specific immune response against the BCG and the tuberculosis and the poliomyelitis, but also uh, they can induce protection for other non-related diseases. This kind of uh, uh, protection is called uh, heterologous protection and uh, uh, is, uh, it has been described uh, uh, particularly for uh, live attenuated vaccines. So uh, we have said that it's really important the innate immune response for um, host protection in the newborn. Uh, Mm, the adaptive response is not brilliant in the newborn, so Mother Nature uh, can help us because uh, uh, maternal antibodies uh, um, are uh, uh, transferred to the fetus and then to the newborns uh, in early life. And in particular, um, this kind of immunity can be also called the maternal passive immunity um, and uh, uh, is uh, represented by uh, maternal IgG antibodies uh, that are transferred through uh, the placenta to the fetus and maternal uh, secretory IgA transferred via breast milk uh, after birth, of course. Um, 
The first kind of uh, maternal passive protection is represented by, again, maternal IgG. Maternal uh, IgG uh, transfer occurs after 28 weeks of gestation. That means uh, in late, uh, during late pregnancy, uh, late second and uh, uh, third trimester of pregnancy. That means that a um, child that is born very preterm uh, before 28 weeks of gestation um, uh, does not have uh, uh, maternal antibodies for protection. Uh, the transfer of maternal uh, IgG uh, from the maternal blood uh, occurs by transitosis at the level of syncytiotrophoblasts. Um, uh, maternal antibodies are internalized within endosomes because they bind the neonatal uh, FC receptor. Uh, and then the complex is carried towards the basal cell membrane uh, and also released into the fetal circulation. It is very interesting that the transfer of maternal IgG um, is uh, um, dependent of uh, um, the concentration of maternal antibodies. Uh, so the more we have a uh, high concentration of specific maternal antibodies in maternal blood, uh, the, uh, the more these antibodies are uh, transferred to, to the fetus. And this is why um, uh, maternal immunization, immunization uh, in late pregnancy uh, is, uh, um, is, is an important tool for, uh, to protect the, uh, the child in early life. Uh, vaccines that are currently recommended during pregnancy are uh, the inactivated influenza vaccine, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis vaccine, while all the live attenuated vaccine are not are currently not given to pregnant women, including rubella, measles, mumps, and varicella vaccines, um, because of the risk of maternal infection and maternal fever that can be dangerous for the, for the fetus. But maternal antibodies transferred to, to the newborns are, are okay, an important tool for protection for newborns in early life. But since they uh, derive from the mother, uh, the concentration of these antibodies starts to decay, um, starting from the third month of life. And by the six months of life of the newborn, uh, we do not uh, have, uh, we cannot detect uh, maternal antibodies uh, um, anymore in the, in the blood of the of the child. So. Uh, till now, we have said uh, that neonatal vaccination is not really effective uh, and that maternal vaccination during pregnancy is effective to uh, give a boost to the mother to produce high levels of uh, uh, antibodies to be transferred to the fetus. Uh, but then uh, the vertically transferred maternal antibodies decay uh, during the first months of life of the, of the child. So we need something more. Um, and again, Mother Nature can help us because uh, uh, secretory IgA are transferred via breast milk after birth uh, and during breastfeeding. And you know, probably you already know that breastfeeding can last also for one or two years uh, of life of the baby. So this is a continuous uh, stimulus and protection that the mother uh, can give to the baby uh, in a safe way. Uh, also, lower concentration of IgG can be transferred via breast milk, but the most important uh, um, uh, antibody to be transferred via breast milk is secretory IgA. Also, um, you probably already all know about the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissues. Um, uh, which is the immune system associated uh, uh, to the respiratory tract and gastrointestinal tract mainly. Um, and this is a, an important, uh, um, uh, an important uh, um, kind of immunity um, uh, related to, to breastfeeding because uh, uh, mammary glands are 
integrating the mucosa immune system of the mother. So that means that during lactation, uh, plasma cells uh, of the uh, gastrointestinal tract and respiratory tract of the mothers can migrate to the mammary gland uh, uh, secrete uh, specific IgA, secretory IgA, uh, which are uh, um, specific for um, pathogens that the mother has encountered in uh, her gastrointestinal tract and respiratory tract, and the secretory IgA is transferred by breast milk to the newborn and can protect the mucosal uh, respiratory tract and gastrointestinal tract of the baby. So uh, uh, secretory IgA uh, in the breast milk are expression of uh, the uh, pool of antibodies uh, that the mother has uh, uh, developed uh, during her life in her mucosal uh, uh, tracts. So to apply all these uh, concepts uh, in real life, <laughs> if you can say this, uh, we designed a study um, thanks to this uh, great collaboration from Sapienza University and Bambino Gesù Children's Hospital, in particular between the Department of Mater Maternal and Child Health and uh, uh, Neonatology Unit unit in particular and the B cell research unit lead by Dr. Carzetti at the Bambino Gesù Children's Hospital um, during uh, uh, these last two years. So we have uh, um, we started from the observation that uh, uh, SARS uh, CoV 2 infection uh, was not uh, uh, so um, uh, frequent and dangerous for newborns. Again, newborns uh, are generally considered a vulnerable population. So we uh, were expecting to, um, that this population would be very interested and dramatically interested by this uh, um, terrible infection. Uh, so first evidences told us that neonatal infection is actually possible, uh, is, is possible in uh, uh, the, the infection can be transmitted from the mother to the fetus uh, in, in utero or intrapartum and we uh, talk about a vertically infected newborn or uh, after birth uh, by a droplet and respiratory secretion uh, horizontally. But, uh, um, uh, again, uh, uh, despite the neonatal immune system is considered immature, we actually uh, noticed that this infection was not so, um, uh, the, the rate of uh, uh, infection in newborns was low and clinical outcomes uh, uh, are generally favorable. So we designed a study uh, to um, investigate the possible role of maternal protection um, also so in the scenario of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we enrolled uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive mothers uh, who were admitted at Policlinico Umberto Primo Hospital to deliver their babies. We enrolled all the babies uh, uh, were also tested for SARS-CoV-2 immediately after birth, uh, and we collected biological samples of maternal milk and maternal serum, and also neonatal saliva and neonatal serum uh, during the first two days after birth. And then we follow up the diets that we enrolled in the studies, and then at two months of life, we um, checked for the baby, uh, and we again collected the biological samples of breast milk and uh, um, maternal serum, neonatal saliva and neonatal serum. So we were able to enroll uh, 28 diets at time zero, so at birth, uh, and we uh, were able to follow up 21 of these diets. So these are the first results. So we, um, um, we looked for the concentration of spike-specific antibodies uh, specific for SARS-CoV-2 uh, in maternal serum. And as you can see here in the uh, in panel A, uh, 
the concentration of spike-specific IgG 48 hours after delivery, uh, delivery was not high and uh, increased significantly two months later, accordingly with the timing of the adaptive immunity. Probably the infection in these mothers uh, was too recent, uh, and so um, the uh, IgG levels uh, were not uh, um, uh, were not tied. This was our explanation. And this also can explain why we did not find any uh, IgG in the uh, in neonatal blood. So there was no transfer of maternal antibodies. As I told you before, the transfer of a maternal IgG through the placenta is dependent on maternal concentration uh, in the serum of the mothers. We uh, had just one case of a vertically infected newborn and one case of a, a horizontally infected newborn. So just one of our newborns became infected by SARS-CoV-2 after birth. So uh, we were really surprised when we uh, found spike-specific IgA in the saliva of infants two months after birth, infants who were breastfed. So although all the infants that we enrolled in our study uh, were not infected because they were not because uh, spike-specific antibodies were not detected in the serum of these newborns, uh, spike-specific IgA were detected in the saliva of, of our newborns, uh, and in particular of newborns uh, who received breast milk. So we looked for also spike-specific IgA in the breast milk of our mothers, both in the first milk, so the colostrum, 48 hours after birth and two months later. And not surprisingly, we found uh, the presence of spike-specific IgA in the breast milk. But still, this was not enough to explain the presence of uh, IgA in the saliva of our newborns. Uh, this is important to, um, to say, we collected the saliva of the newborns uh, far from the um, uh, breastfeeding, so the saliva was not contaminated with breast milk. So we looked for uh, also, the, we performed a molecular test and an antigen test to look for the presence of the virus or of uh, the antigen in breast milk. Both uh, these uh, uh, tests uh, resulted negative. So we did not find uh, the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus in the breast milk. And this was also um, described in literature. So we thought uh, that there, um, there, there was something else in breast milk uh, able to um, induce uh, an immune response specific for, for this virus uh, uh, by the mucosal immune system of the newborn. So we thought uh, that, the that the, the, the antigen was uh, present in the breast milk, uh, but complex with, the, with an antibody, so forming an immune complex. Immune complex can be present in breast milk, so um, uh, IgG immune complexes were described in breast milk, con uh, linking antigens um, of uh, food origin to induce tolerance in these newborns, uh, food tolerance in the newborns, but IgA antibodies were never described before. So we um, uh, performed an in-house ELISA uh, to detect specifically the presence of IgA spike uh, immune complexes. And we were really excited when we uh, found uh, these uh, immune complexes in the breast milk of uh, mothers infected uh, by SARS-CoV-2. These, uh, um, these uh, uh, experiments were performed using a cohort independent from the, from the one uh, um, enrolled in Policlinic Umberto I of Rome. Uh, this cohort was uh, enrolled in another center uh, in Tuscany, Italy. Uh, and again, we were able to confirm the same um, 
uh, the same finding. So we found spike specific IGA in the breast milk uh, of the mothers, uh, spike specific IGA in the saliva of the newborns who were never infected, uh, so who tested negative for um, uh, molecular test uh, by nasopharyngeal swabs. Uh, and we were able to detect immune complexes also uh, in the breast milk of this uh, independent cohort. So we uh, started uh, to think, because we uh, found these, uh, these results, that maybe there is something more than uh, a passive immunity that the mother can uh, uh, give to the newborn. Maybe the mother is also able to actively promote the development of the immune system of the baby, not just passively transfer her antibodies. Um, we moved on uh, um, with the introduction of the uh, mRNA vaccine also for pregnant women. We decided to uh, um, enroll another cohort, uh, another population, um, so including uh, pregnant women who received the vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 in the late uh, second trimester, third trimester of pregnancy. Uh, we um, uh, collected the super, um, we collected cord blood, uh, maternal milk, and maternal serum uh, in this uh, uh, in this second population uh, two days after birth. That corresponds uh, uh, to two months after vaccination, because these mothers were vaccinated during their uh, late second third trimester of pregnancy. So we decided to compare uh, these, uh, uh, these results with the, with the ones from the mothers infected uh, naturally by the virus. And as you can see here, um, the uh, vaccination was able to induce uh, uh, an efficient uh, production of uh, spike-specific IgG antibodies uh, in the mothers vaccinated. Um, this uh, concentration was significantly higher compared to the concentration of IgG induced by natural infection. And consequently, we were able to find uh, also maternal IgG in core blood. And these uh, um, concentrations, as you can see on the right, uh, positively correlate uh, um, very well, as you can see in the image. But when we uh, looked at maternal milk, uh, this is what we found. So we uh, found significant, not significantly, but uh, there was a trend, uh, lower concentration of spike-specific IgA in the breast milk of, uh, uh, of vaccinated mother compared to infected mothers. Uh, and we did not detect the presence of uh, uh, immune complexes in the breast milk of vaccinated mothers. So um, we uh, decide to include another population, a third one, of mothers who received the vaccine during lactation. So, after partition, um, this third cohort, uh, from this third cohort, we collected uh, samples of uh, maternal milk uh, and maternal serum. Uh, and I will show you the results of uh, um, the uh, antibodies specific for uh, spike, the spike protein in the breast milk of all these cohorts. Um, and here we can see that uh, mothers who received the uh, vaccine during lactation uh, had a significantly higher concentration of IgA compared to mothers who received the vaccine during pregnancy. And this probably was why we collected breast milk two weeks after vaccination in the mothers who received the vaccine during lactation, while we collected the breast milk after two months from the vaccination in the mothers who were vaccinated during pregnancy. So the timing, we concluded the timing of vaccination is really important when we 
uh, when we looked for specific antibodies. And this uh, is also important to guide um, the uh, campaign of vaccination uh, for SARS-CoV-2, but in general also for other infections during pregnancy. The timing is really important. So to conclude, uh, I, I think that uh, um, in, the, in the puzzle of early life immunity, um, uh, for sure the uh, innate immune system of the newborn, so the innate harm for host defense and the adaptive harm for host defense are important. Is important also maternal antibodies passive protection, but probably two more pieces should be added and should be, uh, you know, should guide, the, uh, should drive also the, the research in the following years. Um, and these two more pieces are represented by uh, the mucosal immunity of the newborn, which can maybe be considered uh, in between the innate response and the adaptive response and also maternal active immunity. So the um, ability of the mothers to present antigens uh, to the fetus uh, probably and to the newborns um, via breast milk in a safe way uh, uh, that is probably able to uh, trigger and to promote actively the development of the immune system uh, uh, of the newborns. So, so I think that uh, uh, I can conclude uh, my talk here. Um, and uh, we have a lot of time for questions, actually. Thank you, Dr. Conti, for your presentation. It's so obviously very important research is very interesting. Um, and we can now invite the audience to ask any questions if you have uh, about the presentation, you can drop them in the chat or unmute yourself and ask them. In the meantime, I have a more of a simple question uh, kind of pertaining to the background information you gave. I was just wondering how the uh, antibodies from the mother are concentrated in the breast milk. How uh, in the breast milk? Yeah. So, um, how? So, as I told you, the antibodies in the breast milk. I can show you the slide again, if I correctly get your question. Okay, here. So during lactation, uh, what happens uh, is that plasma cells uh, that are present in the uh, gastrointestinal tract of the of the mother, the adult, and also here is not so yes, but also from the respiratory tract of the mother's plasma cells are uh, migrate uh, to the mammary gland and secrete uh, uh, specific IgA. These plasma cells are uh, specific for uh, pathogens that the mother has encountered uh, during her life. Uh, and these antibodies uh, uh, secreted in the breast milk are transferred to the, to the newborns. Uh, was this your question? Or yeah. you ask it? And also, so, breast milk uh, and breastfeeding can last for several months. So this means that this is a continuous uh, um, transfer of, of antibodies from the mother to the newborns. So the newborns can be protected uh, during his first weeks of life, but also later, so also for months. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you answered my question, thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? I think uh, a lot of our 
participants um they are at a student event today so yeah. a lot of them aren't here and your presentation was very clear anyway i don't think <laughs> we would have many questions unanswered in the first place do you think maybe you could uh tell us about what you plan to do next with the experiment following this research so which are the next steps yeah yes of course so since this was the first time for us to uh, describe these mechanisms for active protection uh, uh, of the mother for the newborns uh, so now we are studying uh, um, these these mechanisms for other infectious diseases uh, of course there are other infections that are really important uh, uh, and can be very dangerous for the newborns for example uh, the respira respiratory syncytial virus uh, which is one of the uh, most dangerous virus that can cause respiratory distress and uh, um, bronchiolitis uh, in the newborns so we are uh, now studying uh, uh, these mechanisms for other infectious diseases and in particular uh, rsv uh, for the rsv um, and then of course we are trying uh, uh, to um, uh, find other um, you know, prove for the presence of immune complexes in the breast milk of these mothers. And also really interesting would be uh, to, to, um, um, to find eventually the presence uh, of uh, uh, immune complexes or antigen presenting cells uh, also in the placenta, for example, or um, uh, that can explain uh, um, these mechanisms uh, also during pregnancy, not just uh, uh, after birth. Uh, so another mechanisms for active protection, uh, for example, uh, would be through the uh, presence of antigen presenting cells, uh, maternal antigen presenting cells uh, that can present, uh, of course, the antigen to the fetus uh, in a safe way. The same concept of immune complexes. Uh, um, this is uh, another, uh, you know, um, um, uh, aim that we have, that we are studying currently. And also, you know, uh, very important, is, it, these concepts are also for uh, maternal vaccination during pregnancy or maybe during breastfeeding. So to vaccinate the mother during breastfeeding uh, uh, can be uh, also uh, important for for the newborn and for the um, for the child. Has there been any evidence um, about uh, the mechanism you just suggested um, by getting maternal antigen presenting cells to present an antigen to a fetus? Has that um, has any research been published on that, or is it just a hypothesis? It is an hypothesis, but we know that there are uh, um, there are um, published papers about the uh, that describes the transfer of maternal cells from the mother to the fetus, and also in the opposite direction, so from the fetus to the mothers. This bidirectional transfer of cells uh, is important for you know fetal maternal tolerance um, so these uh, mechanisms uh, were described uh, uh, in the context of fetal maternal tolerance uh, but probably uh, this transfer of maternal cells uh, through the placenta um, is also important to induce uh, the development of the immune system of the newborn so there are papers uh, describing the transfer of of maternal cells from the mother to the uh, to the newborns but not specifically um, you know for the uh, development uh, of, of a specific immune response of the fetus or of, of the newborn lately of course
Um, maybe we can end a bit early then. If no one has any other questions, maybe we can wait um, another two minutes. Um, and then wrap it up. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any other questions. Um, so I'd like to thank you again, uh, Dr. Conti, for your talk. It was very clear. I think that's why there aren't many questions. Um, it was nice to have everything described from the basics. Um, and your research was done very smoothly. Um, so thank you again. And um, have a good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. And uh, uh, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the, the talk. Thank you. Bye. Bye.